So uh, let's get started. So hello, ev hello everyone around the world. Uh, welcome to this Black Hole Pi webinar, the Black Hole, the Black Hole Pi project or the Black Hole Partnership on International Research and Education is an uh, U.S. National Science Foundation funded project to support the science utilization of the Event Horizon Telescope. Our contribution in through uh, from the instrument design to data processing, theoretical simulation, testing general relativity to training and education. And this webinar is the last one in the spring 2022 series, where we have covered many aspects of the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. Uh, Rosie, our project manager, will post a link to the prior YouTube channel that you can watch our previous uh, webinars. Now, before we get started, uh, let's go through some uh, housekeeping items. So first, for other panelists, please make sure that you are muted. Uh, I will mute myself after this introduction. Uh, for the web webinar attendees, uh, please open up your Q&A window from Zoom so that during the talk, you can type in the questions and we will monitor those questions and answer them when appropriate. Now, the presentation will last for about an hour, but we schedule a little bit more time to answer uh, questions. And finally, our project manager, Ros Rosie, is going to post a survey uh, in the chat the survey is very short, uh, please fill it in so that we can keep uh, improving uh, and continue this webinar. Okay, so today's speaker is Professor Feria Osell of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Arizona. Dr. Osell develops theoretical and computation method to study black holes and neutron star and build models of their extreme environments. She also made the first predictions of image of nearby supermassive black holes at different wavelengths based on their based on her work on accretion flow, which guided the development of the Event Horizon Telescope. And yesterday, about 25 uh, hours ago, Dr. Osell unveiled to the world the first image of the supermassive black hole at the center of the Milky Way, Sagittarius A star. Rosie is going to post uh, more information about Sagittarius A star in the chat, so you can just uh, go to the link and, and look those up. But in today's webinar, uh, horizon scale physics around Sagittarius A star, uh, Professor Ocell will tell us more about the science details behind yesterday's image. So Dr. Ocell, please uh, take it away. Thank you so much, CK, um, and wonderful to be with all of you around the world. Thank you for that introduction. Um, ye yesterday, we did indeed share the first image. I was privileged to share it on, on behalf of the entire collaboration, uh, the work of many, many people. But today, what we want to do, as CK just um, explained, is give you more of the details of the science that went behind um, making the image, what we learned from the image, and what we can learn about accretion environments. So with that, I'm going to um, share my screen. Hopefully, you will be able to see it. Do you see it in full screen mode? OK, excellent. So as I mentioned, um, this is the work of an entire collaboration. I am the, um, just speaking on behalf of the six papers that we have written um, on, um, on the Galactic Center Black Hole Sagittarius A star. The papers are out on Astrophysical Journal Letters. So um, those of you among the, in the audience who are scientists, um, uh, you're, of course, uh, more than welcome to find even more details in those papers. So what is special about Sag A star? A lot of things. First of all, it is, um, the it's the black hole in the center of our own galaxy, the Milky Way. Here we have an image um, of the Milky Way as we see it um, on a summer night. Um, beautiful um, towards the constellation Sagittarius is the center of our galaxy. Um, so if you, um, if you follow um, that, that constellation and turn your telescopes towards it, it uh, is where you, you can find the source that, um, that we imaged uh, with the Event Horizon Telescope. Let me take you on a short journey of um, how these observations were done, um, because as you know, um, EHT, um, is an is a interferometric observatory that relies on the telescope's um, millimeter wavelength observations 
around the world. And here are um, some of them that are being highlighted as the Earth rotates. Different pairs of telescopes get to look at our source in the, in the sky and obtain information. Um, now, when we look towards the center of our galaxy, we are dealing with our own atmosphere as well as the um, gas, especially ionized gas, uh, that is within the disk of the galaxy. So we're looking through the arms of the galaxy towards the center. And of course, behind all of that is the center of our galaxy, where the motions of stars have already revealed the presence of a 4 million solar mass object. And um, what the EHD has been able to do is obtain a direct image of, of this object using that telescope array. And we shared this image with you yesterday. I'm going to break up the talk into seven different segments. Um, hopefully this will allow you to get a taste of the various types of analyses that we have done. The um, first part is going to be uh, on the HD observations of Sag A star. Um, and what I mean by that is I want to tell you what, where this data comes from and what the extent of the data is that, um, that we've been able to analyze so far. This is, um, these are the results from the 2017 global observation campaign, just like the M87 results were a few years back in 2019. It is the same 2017 data set where we were incredibly lucky, um, blue skies everywhere. And the blue skies is important because even though we are observing in the millimeter wavelength, so you might think bad weather doesn't affect you, it actually does. Um, millimeter observations are really sensitive to the moisture column in the atmosphere. So clear skies, not much turbulence, and uh, technical readiness in all of our sites made the 2017 campaign a success. We have other data sets in the can, which we will hopefully share in the coming months and years with you. What did these observations look like? Something special about Sad J star was that our observations were multi-wavelength. So what you're seeing here is the EHT observing windows. This, this is our 230 gig, uh, gigahertz observations spanning basically April 6th to April 11th in these little blocks, April 7th being our best block, as you can see here. But all of these other observatories turned towards Sag A star either simultaneously or nearly simultaneously as the HT was observing our source. And that provided um, excellent background information um, that we used in order to interpret our results. I especially want to point out Swift, Chandra, and New Star, um, and these observing blocks um, that guided again um, the interpretation of uh, some of the EHD results. April 6, April 7, and April 11th are the few dates that I'm going to concentrate on. April 6 and April 7 are our best dates. Here is the EHD Alma SMA light curve. What that means is the total flux that we're observing from the source, how it changes from minute to minute, hour to hour, is plotted here. You can see that there is some variability in this flux. We know Sagittarius A star is, shows this type of activity from prior monitoring with uh, ALMA, for example, as well as prior monitoring with, with our X-ray observations where we see this kind of uh, flickering activity. Um, here is the new starlight curve, Swift and Chandra light curve. You can see that April 6 and April 7 is fairly quiescent, meaning there's little flickering happening here. Um, whereas April 11th showed a prominent X-ray flare. Again, something we've seen in the past, but this time it happened to coincide with the HD observations. And you can see the flux changed more drastically uh, during that observation um, compared, to, compared to April 6th and 7th. So April 7th is our best day in our set of papers. We have analyzed 6th and 7th together. April 11th is going to be um, the subject of future papers where we try to understand the impact of a flare on the image and, and vice versa. I'll take a moment to remind everybody of how interferometry works. Um, we have 
as we said, a worldwide array of telescopes, but it is the pairs of telescopes that we rely on in order to fill in the, uh, the information in the image space. So each pair of telescopes is going to give us one set, one um, point in the Fourier space where we measure the spatial frequency. And um, the information that we get um, relies on the separation between those telescopes. So this is that separation length L in units of the wavelength of our observation, which is 1.3 millimeters. But of course, if we had only two points in the Fourier space, we could not possibly make an image. That's just one note, if you will, in a song, and you're supposed to reconstruct the entire song. So what we do is rely on the rotation of the Earth so that we get different projections, projection lengths in the sky. And not only that, but each telescope has the handshake. So as you increase the number of telescopes, um, you get um, each telescope talking to another one, filling in this, um, this information in this Fourier space. This is the April 6th and April 7th coverage for um, Sagittarius A star baseline, we call it baseline coverage, again, um, in, the, in the interferometric plane, um, you see that April 7th has these nice long tracks, which turn out to be really important in terms of getting vital information about the image out. However, even on our best day, you also see that our coverage is incomplete. Um, more technical term is a sparse coverage, where there are missing pieces of information about the image. And when I describe to you our imaging algorithms, this is going to be important in terms of um, what this means about what we can be sure about and what we are less sure about. So this is again the same um, baseline coverage from April 7th. And let's now forget about this as a muthal um, information. So obviously this is all different pieces of the, the uh, image information that we're filling in, but assuming for a moment that there is no azimuthal variation in the image, one thing we can do is collect all of this into a single plot where we get the amplitude or we call it flux density. Um, this is in units of Jansky as a function of baseline separations, again, in units of uh, billions of wavelengths, so giga lambda. The, the, this is our zero baseline flux, so how much flux there is in the entire image. And as you go to higher and higher baseline separations, that gives you the information about the finer and finer structures of the image. So when you look at this, just like with M87, if you have seen those data, there is a characteristic ringing structure, which is what we love to see. What I mean by ringing is that it's high here, goes towards a first minimum here. This is the location of the first minimum, goes towards a second maximum, and then falls off. And in the case of Sag star, we now see evidence of a third maximum. So this type of ringing function um, is, is called a Bessel function, and it is the telltale sign of an image that is either a ring or a disk. So how do you tell the difference? Um, you, you use a lot of uh, imaging algorithms and um, compare it with the, with the data that, that you have seen. Be, but let's set that aside for a second, what the details of the image is. The first minimum in the visibility amplitude already gives you the image size roughly. So this is going to be 52 in the units that we like to use, micro arc seconds, so 10 to the minus 6 of an arc second, a tiny, tiny sliver in the sky in, in angular size. And um, this is just scaled uh, for uh, Sagittarius A star. So just by the fact that the first minimum is here, we know that the source size is roughly 52 micro arc seconds. Okay, what else can we do? I will um, now turn to the second uh, topic that I want to discuss, which is 
why was Sagittarius a star harder? I will get to what else we, can we do when we talk about the um, imaging and do a little bit more comparison with M87. Um, but I know it's it's been something on the uh, in the minds of people. Why why didn't we release Sag A star first? And why was it harder to do? Why did it take us extra years? Well, there are three distinct reasons for that. First one, interstellar scattering. As I mentioned in the very beginning, and we saw in that beautiful video of going from the Earth to the galactic center, we go through the disk of the galaxy, and there is ionized gas in the disk of the galaxy in the, uh, in the arms. And what that does is it scatters the light that we get from our source. Scattering here means two types of effects. Both blur the image. One is diffractive blurring. So let's start with the image on the left, which is our unscattered. If we had a perfect instrument, that's what we would see um, without any kind of blurring that comes from that interstellar scattering. Diffractive blurring, as you can see, um, just um, removes some of that fine scale in the image and refractive scattering makes it look frosty. So both of these happen to the image that we observe. So go, you go from here to B, then add the refractive noise in, in C. Um, and um, this is what it looks like, even, even if we had perfect telescope coverage. So that makes it harder compared to looking away from the galaxy without any of these effects. But we're lucky. So that's, that's going to be a recurrent theme in this webinar. Um, it is bad, but it's not nearly as bad as it could have been. This is again from the same paper by Zhu and collaborators showing how detrimental the effects could be. Within our theoretical models, both, of the, both the image on the left and the image on the right would have been a possibility. And if it was the image on the right, of course, we would have a terrible time reconstructing any sort of feature um, in the black hole image. But through careful modeling and then follow-up observations based on Psaltis and collaborators, Johnson and collaborators, and Sarah Sound and collaborators, who was one of our earlier speakers in this webinar series, we um, got a good handle on how bad the diffractive and refractive noise could be. And we folded that into our modeling. Second reason, Sagittarius A star is a smaller mass black hole, smaller mass compact source than M87, which we know, know is a black hole. A mass of 4 million times the um, solar masses compared to 6 billion solar masses. The time scale of variability around an object scales with its mass. So the more massive it is, the slower it is. For a Sagittarius A star, things can change. Um, so you can see here, this is a light curve um, um, in, in hours. Uh, time is given in hours. It can change anywhere from minutes to hours time scales. For M87, it can change from many hours to days time scales. So again, let me take you from what we expected, what we were bracing for, and what ended up happening. This was our expectation from GRMHD simulations. So the, these light curves that you see here were from our models. We put in all the physics into sophisticated models of what happens around the black hole. And we, um, we followed the gas, how it emits, and we made images and light curves and spectra. We were expecting to see this kind of variability. Sag A star data is shown in the green band here. Yes, it is variable, but it wasn't our worst nightmare. Um, showing you again what the flux that we saw on April 5, 6, and 7, this is the level of variability that we ended up detecting. So we had to alter our imaging algorithms to allow for this flickering, but it wasn't nearly the, if you go to an ocean analogy, the 30 foot waves we were expecting to see that would have completely blurred our image. It was just the two foot waves that basically when you take a long exposure, you know how that blurs your uh, picture a little bit. 
um, it ended up being like that. But it um, certainly complicated our uh, analyses. Variability is a challenge, but one takeaway from this webinar is that our simulations, our best simulations, are still too variable compared to SARJ stars flickering. The third one is the fact that we are a distributed collaboration. We've been used to this. However, COVID made it even worse because even in a distributed collaboration where you see um, where we have literally um, institutions across the globe and we rely on telecons and Zoom uh, for our work, getting together face-to-face -face, at least some periodically really helps with the tough analyses. We've lost that ability in the last couple of years, as, as did everybody else. So um, it made our lives a little bit harder, but uh, we are proud of what we were able to accomplish. Okay, switching gears to um, subject number three, and let me just get a little coffee. We already talked about the fact that we have incomplete coverage of our, of our Fourier space. So what do we do um, to fill in that missing information? Well, we rely on multiple different imaging algorithms and we really try to understand what is robust in our, um, in our extraction of that information and what we are uncertain about and what could change. So let me show you one of these imaging algorithms, this is DIFMAP, and the many thousands of ways in which this information was filled in. So this is a movie, as you can see, you're seeing many, 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 many images that are shown one after another. And these are all the different algorithmic choices, the little different parameter choices that were made to fill in that missing information leading to thousands of images that we ended up calling the top set. Um, so good news, they all look quite similar. There's, there's a hole in the center, the ring size doesn't change. Bad news, the azimuthal information where those bright spots appear really do uh, depend on how you filled in that information. So these are the reconstructions with different algorithmic parameters. But DIFMAP is not our only algorithm. We actually have, um, at this point, more than three. So what we were able to do is image using all of these algorithms and all of their different algorithmic parameters, the same data set, and combine all of this to come up with this robust image that we shared with you yesterday. We went a step further. Um, we also asked ourselves, okay, among all of these reconstructions, are there clusters where the image properties look similar to one another? And how often do we encounter that cluster? So we've relied on um, various feature uh, detection algorithms in order to carry out this clustering. And the data, the, the reconstructions, uh, divided themselves into four distinct categories that you can see here. And the relative frequency is in this bar here of the first group, second group, third group. And a tiny, you see the sliver here about a little less than 2% fourth group. Um, and of course, all of this did go into making the image. So. Let me compare each one of these um, to, um, to the image that, um, the, the combined image that we have seen. So this is cluster one, cluster two, cluster three, and cluster four are what we called non-ring images. And this is the average image at the center. So comparing cluster one to the average image, cluster two to the average image, the third one, and the fourth one, the non-ring-like one, according to our eyes. Good news is that our algorithmic choices affect the azimuthal brightness distribution along the ring, but not the size of the ring. That's why we felt very confident after all of these analyses 
that what we have is a robust ring-like yeah, image. Let me add one more thing. Um, we also did a lot of what we call synthetic data set uh, tests. So there you take, uh, you take images where you know the ground truth. So you make the image, some underlying image that is a ring, that is not a ring, um, and you run it through the entire uh, EHT pipeline from interstellar scattering to the atmospheric noise, to the telescope noise, the entire pipeline. You make what we call synthetic or mock data, and then you apply your algorithms to it and ask, um, how can I, how do I reconstruct this? How successful am I? And the, this type of clustering that we see, especially this presence of non-ring images was present in, um, in our mock data sets in this roughly the same ratio as in SAJ star data set. So even when you're sure that your underlying image is a ring, um, in a small fraction of the time, the data become noisy enough or the orientation is not favorable enough that you cannot reconstruct it perfectly. Okay. So um, moving on to our next topic, how does this compare with M87? Um, what I want to start with is the, um, again, this interferometric data that I shared with you for Sagittarius A star. This is the UV coverage from April 7th. This is, again, the amplitude as a function of baseline length uh, from, um, from that date. And this is M87. So immediately you will see some similarities and some differences. Let's start with the differences. Sag star, if you look at the just the UV map, you'll see that most of our orientations are north-south. What this means is that the pairs of telescopes that talk to one another, that shook hands between themselves, are more in the align with the continents because we have the South Pole Telescope um, for Sagittarius A star that can see it all the time, more in the north-south north, uh, orientation. Whereas for M87, it is mostly east-west. We rely on um, going from um, Europe to uh, the Americas to Hawaii, um, et cetera, in order to get this multiple handshakes and multiple pieces of information. Coming here, what do we see? Well, ringing structure, ringing structure, but the first minimum is not in the same place. Uh, they're at different baseline lengths. Why is that? Because the angular size in the sky is slightly different. Um, M87 is a little smaller in angular size in the sky because of its further away distance um, than, than Sagittarius A star, even though it is more massive. Um, the um, third difference that we see is that the secondary maximum properties are a little different. You see that this comes down a little bit faster in the case of Sag A star. So you've gone to a secondary maximum and then it declined a little bit faster as opposed to this, this um, more gradual decline in the case of M87. And finally, of course, since we have longer baselines, um, we are able to see uh, this, this third peak, or at least the beginnings of that third peak for Sag A star, which we can't see for M87, these finer features. If we were, if we were to put it on the same graph, uh, visibility amplitude versus baseline length, here is what that would look like. Um, this is M87 data. This is Sagittarius A star data. Let's rescale M87 so that it's the same size as Sag A star. And then let's make it decline faster so it is like Sag A star. So why did I do this? Um, what do we learn from this exercise? Well, first that the angular size in the sky is different, which is something we kind of guessed uh, from, from what we knew about their masses. But that also this um, decline in the uh, the decline from the, the maximum, second maximum, tells us, tells us that Sag A star is a fatter ring than M87. So the difference between something that stays for a longer time and declines more slowly 
and one that declines faster is the uh, ring width inside J star versus the ring width in M87. So if we put them on the on a graph that we like to look at, which is what is the width of the ring in units of the ring diameter compared to the diameter of the ring. What we see here is that sad J star um, as reconstructed by one of our imaging algorithms called SMILEY is a little bit larger in the sky, um, not 40 some, but about 50. And it's a little bit fatter, which is it, which means that its fractional width is a little bit higher than M87. That's what we learn uh, from those data. Okay, switching gears one more time. And now going from what we, uh, how we imaged it and how confident we are about um, our, the image properties to what does that tell us about either the black hole or the accretion environment of the black hole. Obviously, these are the goals of the Event Horizon Telescope observations. We not only want to be able to image these objects, which in itself is a little crazy, but we want to use them as laboratories in the sky to learn about things that we wouldn't be able to learn otherwise. Um, and one of that is how does an accretion flow work, especially the type of accretion flows that are around Sagittarius A star and M87. So um, these flows are low luminosity, um, they are low density. Um, M87 feeds at a much higher rate than Sag A star, but even then both are, are uh, considered to be fairly low luminosity accretion flows. They're radiatively inefficient um, and we try to um, model what the magnetic field around them look like, what the temperature uh, of the electrons and the ions are like, and, um, and um, everything else that, that we can infer about uh, their geometry and properties. In order to extract information from these new set of observations and the new Sag star image, what we did was uh, generate across the collaboration a very large suite of new GRMHD simulations, general relativistic magnetohydrodynamic simulations. General relativistic because we are in the um, relativistic space times, so Einstein's equations. Magneto because it's a magnetized plasma, so um, we have to uh, take into account how that uh, plasma moves in the magnetic fields and the hydrodynamics is how the gas, basically the ionized gas move. We ran a very large suite, as I said, but um, roughly divided into um, two main directions in terms of how the magnetic field is organized. These are SANE simulations. Uh, it's an acronym that uh, doesn't really matter. The magnetic field looks more disordered like this. And these are MAD simulations, magnetically arrested disks with a different black hole spin, where you see that the magnetic field structure is a little bit more ordered. With that, we change the black hole spin, the observer's inclination, the temperature of the electrons versus the ions, um, I think those are the, the main uh, parameters that I can think of right now, but we will go through uh, which of those we can more robustly uh, rule in or rule out. So in this huge library, we said, okay, what are the types of observations we can um, compare these to and say whether this is a pass, it, some fraction of the time at least satisfies um, the observational constraints that we have, or a fail. It really does not satisfy the observational constraints that we have. So let's call these pass-fail tests. And group one of these pass-fail tests is, comes directly from the EHD data, image size and structure. Am I getting the basic size of the image right for a given black hole mass and spin? Or um, am I really uh, missing the mark here in terms of the, either the symmetry of the image or the size of the image? So um, a passing simulation looks like this, where 
Remember that we said the location of the first minimum gives you that first information about your image size. Did I get it roughly right? Um, does the minimum fall in this gray band here? And then the second bit is the more asymmetric an image is. You see how this is roughly a ring, even if there's a brightness variation around it, whereas this is really a crescent. It's very faint on the right side and very bright on the left-hand side. When you have an image like this and you look at the different um, information, the interferometric information amplitude as a function of baseline, you get a lot of amplitude at these long baselines, as opposed to where our data are, which is these black points here. So a simulation like this both gets the minimum right and produces the right amounts of amplitude here, whereas a failing one neither gets the minimum right nor uh, the amount of um, power at those, at those longer baselines. Okay, so image size and structure of all the uh, library uh, images, which ones pass, which ones fail? Location, amplitude at large baselines. So this is a way of synthesizing all of it, all that information into hopefully um, succinct visuals. This is sane versus mad. This is the observer's inclination, 10, 30, 50, 70, 90. So this is edge on, I'm looking at the accretion flow this way versus face on, I'm looking at it um, basically um, as, a, as a whole ring. Um, as you go from inner radii of these wedges to the outer radii, this is electron temperature over the ion temperature. So these are a little bit cooler. These are hotter electrons. Um, and going from left to right is the black hole spin, counter rotating, large spin, zero spin, co-rotating large spin. Why is there green, yellow, and, and red? Because we, we, again, just like we did with our imaging algorithms, we made our models with multiple algorithms, multiple um, um, multiple codes that make slightly different assumptions about how GRMHD or the rendering is done. So um, we wanted to make sure that uh, we, our results don't depend on how it is that we implemented the solutions of those equations. Green means however you implemented it, these models tended to pass. Yellow means some failed, some passed, and uh, red means all of them failed. What do we learn from image size and structure? Well, red means mm, it's a no-go. So edge on these high inclination, um, especially positive spin cases do not fit our data, not the image size, not the image structure. So we can rule those out. Second type of pass fail test was the whole spectrum of the source. As, as I mentioned, EHT observes in one particular wavelength, especially now we are only at 230 gigahertz. We hope to expand it uh, in our future observations. But it doesn't mean we don't have other information about SAG star. We have infrared information, we have X-ray information from many years of observing the source. So whatever our model is, it should also obey the amount of flux, amount of brightness the source generates in these other wave bands. And if it's too much or too little, then we should rule out that model. So um, again, looking at a mad type of magnetic field configuration versus a sane type of magnetic field configuration, a pass example and a fail example. Hot electrons that are in magnetic fields emit through two processes, synchrotron, where they just gyrate around the magnetic field, and bremsstrahlung, which is um, the ions and the electrons um, accelerate in, their pres in one another's presence, and the electrons um, give rise to this X-ray emission. So um, the model on the left, here are our data points, here is our infrared data point, here is our X-ray data point, it does well. And as you can see, um, the, the peak is um, appearing a little bit further right than this peak um, in, the same, um, simulation, in the same simulation. This fail 
completely overproduced because it's, um, it's a little cooler. Um, and cooler means that bremsstrahlung is more effective um, and synchrotron uh, um, peak looks a little bit different. It fails here. So this is our upper limit from the x-rays and this is the amount of x-rays this model produced. So we say, mm, no, we, um, this is not an acceptable model. By running this broadband spectrum test through our entire library, what we ended up learning, and this is the first time we're getting at this, um, so we're very excited about it, is something about the temperature of the electrons. What we are plotting here is effectively the temperature, the gas pressure over density. So uh, you look at the MAD models, they are the curves are all a little bit higher for these different spins than the SANE models by a factor of five to 10. Um, so SANE models are cooler than MAD models, which means they peak at smaller radio frequencies, which is good for IR constraints, but they tend to overproduce X-rays by thermal bremsstrahlung, which is bad for X-ray constraints. So even though we, again, we have these sophisticated models, this is hard physics how much heat are the electrons getting? How do they communicate with the, with the ions in the flow? These are unsolved problems um, in, uh, in accretion physics and in, thermal, uh, in um, uh, plasma physics in general. So this is a first clue that um, MAD and SANE could be distinguished as well as the temperature of the flow could be distinguished. Um, because, um, because of how much they produce in different wave bands. So well, how do our models do in these broadband spectrum constraints? Well, MAD doesn't do great for IR constraints and SANE doesn't do great for X-ray flux constraints, exactly for this, this reason of one is cooler than the other. So um, in one case, you're overproducing one, in one case, you're underproducing the other or overproducing the other, excuse me. So um, again, we are starting to rule out some, some regions uh, of the parameter space. And what we're learning from this is SANE models in general, these lower temperature models are having a hard time with the X-ray flux constraints. Last um, test that I'm going to tell you about is variability. We already saw it. In fact, let me uh, go right to that slide. Model prediction, reality, right? So yes, flickering, but not as bad as what we thought. Most models, especially MAD, but even sane, say this, this turbulent motion and the translation of that into how much light is being emitted should be large. What we're seeing is that it's there, but it's not very large. So in fact, we did not rule out models based on variability because we would basically rule out all our simulations just on this one constraint. So we treated that separately. We get the message. There is something probably missing from our, um, uh, our simulations as complete as we try to make them. Uh, it could be some dissipative processes, but um, there is work to be done um, in understanding what controls the variability in these simulations. Okay, last topic in the last five-ish minutes is testing the black hole metric, um, which is not what we understand about the black hole environment, but about the black hole spacetime itself. What is the metric of a black hole? Is it exactly what is predicted by uh, general relativity? And uh, do we have enough information to, um, to say um, whether um, based on the information that we already had about SAG star, uh, whether we can um, rule out or favor um, certain models. So what we did um, in the sixth paper of the series is we explored alternatives to the Kerr hypothesis. Um, this is again GRMHD Kerr, so this is GR, but we extended that metric either through perturbations, analytic perturbations like the JP metric, the Johansson Saltus metric, analytic Kerr Sen metric, or we made even more um, 
but I, I'm just going to go ahead and call it crazy, although they're not crazy. They're just, um, they're just alternatives to, to black holes. Um, make a boson star that is super compact, but it still has a surface just above the horizon, um, or, or a dilaton, um, or a wormhole. So we generated images in all of these different metrics by putting a plasma around it uh, with a covariant model. And as you see, the boson star doesn't have the donut hole. Okay, great. So that's, we can rule out just based on that. But the others have a donut hole. What really changes between them is the size of the ring or the shadow. Um, in all cases, the ring follows the shadow size, which is great. It allows us to use what we measure for the, the ring size to, um, to constrain the shadow size, which is the, the key characteristic of what a metric predicts. Um, but for the exact same parameters of the uh, black hole mass and spin, you see that I can make smaller or larger rings. So I should be able to use the new information we obtained with the Event Horizon Telescope to tell the difference between these uh, possibilities. We went through a very careful measurement of the image size, the ring size, um, using these three different algorithms, um, uh, Smiley, Clean, and EHT imaging. And you see that, again, when we look at fractional width versus mean diameter, there are small differences between the algorithms due to their, the particular parametric choices that they have made. They're all statistically consistent with one another across different imaging algorithms, but it is helpful to quantify this using synthetic data, as I mentioned earlier, um, in order to say, okay, what is, what, how, what, what is the underlying image size um, that, that we can infer from this and what is the shadow size we can infer from this. So we've done this careful analysis for all the top set of all the imaging algorithms. And we then followed up with um, using the full library of GRMHD simulations or um, analytic models for the CURE um, simulations or analytic models for all of those other non-CURE metrics that, that I showed you. How can we use the image size as a proxy for the shadow size? How good is that coupling? What is the uncertainty in that coupling? So by using these extensive simulations, we quantified what is the difference between the ring and the shadow size, fractional difference. And these are the histograms that you see, um, all consistent with one another, independent of um, the metrics we use and the particular um, calculation methods that we use. Then we said, okay, let's take all of this and run it, th run it through our mock data generation and apply our imaging techniques on them. What are we going to see? So, uh, sorry, let me go back. Remember this slide was on the real data and we saw these small differences. This slide is on mock data. I know what the underlying image is. I've made mock data out of it. And now I want to quantify um, how our imaging algorithms are doing in terms of measuring that diameter. So we took our analytic and MHD models. We took our synthetic data results that you see uh, for on the right to correct measurement biases. And now we are at a point where we can compare our measurement to the prediction from the known mass of Sag A star and its predicted uh, ring diameter. And for that, we relied on both the Keck measurement from the UCLA group and gravi um, gravity measurement, gravity instrument uh, measurement of the stellar orbits and the mass that is derived from that, um, from the uh, Max Planck group. Um, and uh, with, for both of those sets, we said, okay, let's take combinations of the um, bias measurements and the, um, on the tracking of the ring size and the, and the shadow size measurements and ask ourselves, what, what do we learn about the shadow angular diameter? 
So these are all these um, curves that you're seeing on this plot. Um, and for these combinations, we can then say, um, how does it fit with our pr prior expectation if Einstein's theory is correct? So let me show you one more time. Um, actually, I'm, I'm gonna have to skip this slide, um, but if you have a question about the event horizon um, constraint, um, event horizon presence constraints that is in that paper, I can come back to it. Um, what I wanna show you here is that um, this is the Keck uncertainty on the angular size of the black hole. This is the BLT or the gravity instrument uncertainty um, on the, um, on the uh, angular size of the black hole. And this is the prior information which uh, we use to predict the Schwarzschild shadow diameter, which is a very well-defined quantity. I can't change it. The only thing I can change here at this point is the spin of the black hole. So Schwarzschild means it's non-spinning. Um, this uh, spin parameter A equals zero. Then I have a single prediction. The spin uncertainty introduces seven and a half percent uncertainty to that one number. So now we can compare, okay, I don't know the spin of the black hole, but for each of these um, prior measurements of the mass, I have a shadow diameter, I have the ring size measured, let's go ahead and compare if they match one another. Um, so matching one another means if this delta parameter is zero, then it's a perfect match between the prediction and the measurement. Um, let's see how, how much we can constrain that delta. And again, seven and a half percent difference between the Schwarzschild prediction and the Kerr prediction. Two plots, Keck priors on the left, VLT gravity priors on the right. Um, for all combinations of our imaging algorithms and ways of um, calibrating the image diameter to the shadow diameter, um, you can see that they're all consistent with a fractional deviation of zero. This band here is that seven and a half percent uncertainty. The more you go to the left, the more spinning the black hole is. So zero is well within uh, one sigma of all of those distributions. But maybe you could say we're starting to see some extremely preliminary, non-significant evidence for maybe this black hole is spinning, maybe not, maybe it's just the measurement uncertainty. When we do it with the LT priors, it's a little bit more pronounced. Again, this whole band is within one sigma of these measurements. Um, we limit the deviation parameter from curve predictions to 10%, which is better than what we were able to do for M87 because we know the mass of Sag 8 star so well through these Keck and BLT observations. Um, and um, here too, again, would it be a little more consistent for a spinning black hole? Maybe, is it significant? No, so we're we are not claiming any sort of um, spin, uh, spin measurement uh, from this, this set of measurements. Okay, um, so uh, comparing the GR constraints of SAJ star and M87, um, this is the EHT SAJ star measurement, which the tighter it is, the better it is, putting all of those bands together of all the ways of slicing and dicing the data and the models and the priors gives you that red band. This is the best we had for M87. So you can see that we've already improved um, uh, doing uh, going from M87 imaging to SAJ star imaging. And um, that's primarily due, due to smaller errors in M over D. And furthermore, for M87, we had this ambiguity. So this was based on the uh, dynamics of stars. The dynamics of gas gave us a different uh, mass. So we said, well, um, if it's that, we have a deviation. Um, and if it's the stellar uh, measurements, then uh, we have 17% uncertainty. Now we don't have that ambiguity, which makes us extremely um, 
happy about this, this new constraint on GR. So um, putting all of this together now with LIGO, the wonderful measurements that are being done for stellar mass black holes, which, which is on the x-axis here, going from 10 to 50 solar masses, LIGO's constraints to million solar mass black holes, Sarge star constraints consistent with zero to M87 constraints that you can see a little bit fatter, um, which is the fractional deviation on the y-axis. Um, but it's remarkable that at this point, around the horizons of black holes, either from gravitational waves or direct imaging, we have no evidence for deviation from curve predictions across eight orders of magnitude in black hole mass. Hopefully, the, the theory will crack somewhere, um, but uh, not yet um, the way we're looking at it. So I think that's my last slide. So I'm going to stop and take questions. OK, thank you very much, uh, Professor Ozell. Uh, this is perfect timing, uh, and we have a couple uh, interesting questions in the Q&A chat. So let me just go read them out uh, one by one. So the, question, uh, the first question is from uh, John Mayer. How much easier would your work be if you use the James Webb uh, telescope? That's a great question. Um, James Webb is going to tell us so much about the formation of galaxies and a little bit about the formation of black holes at higher redshift, but it is not directly useful for the type of work the Event Horizon Telescope is doing. The wavelength is different. So as I mentioned, our black holes, our primary targets in the sky, uh, emit primarily in the radio wavelengths and in, in the X-rays. James Webb looks in that intermediate uh, um, uh, regime, which is the infrared wavelength. So it is closer to what the Keck telescope and the VLTI is doing, the, um, the gravity collaboration. Um, so um, it's not going to benefit our observations directly, and we are not going to be able to do EHT type of work with James Webb, but we are very excited that it's still going to probe uh, formation of black holes at slightly higher redshifts and how, how that impacts their galaxies. Okay, thank you. So the second question is from Peter. Uh, what would be the reason behind the lower than expectation variability? We don't exactly know, um, but we are starting to think about what are some dissipative uh, processes that, that could um, lead to that. So um, I'm just going to throw out a couple of ideas. Um, we know that waves dissipate uh, through a, a variety of, uh, of ways. Um, it's not friction per se, but uh, it's ways in which turbulent energy um, dissipates faster. Um, so we're going to look at, for example, non-ideal MHD models where we allow for that type of dissipation. The other thing is, of course, our models give us the ion temperature and we try to infer the electron temperature from it. This is an imperfect exercise. We are trying to Im improve our understanding of what actually heats the electrons better. And um, in the current models, when we, uh, when we estimate, let's say, the electron temperature, um, we rely on certain uh, characteristics like the, uh, the beta, what we call the beta parameter um, in, the, in the plasma telling us how magnetized it is. And we're probably not mapping that correctly um, to electron temperature. So um, we're going to look at all of those possibilities and um, see if, uh, if we can make them quieter than uh, what, what they are now and more consistent with the data. Okay, thank you. The next question is from the chat. Uh, so it's from uh, Leifany. Uh, Do you choose these two uh, fairly underluminous supermassive black hole on purpose? What would be a brighter or true AGN look like with the EHT? Excellent question. We chose them. Um, yes, because they're underluminous and because they are close to us. So um, we are lucky. 
if the closest black holes to us that had the sufficient angular size in the sky were AGN-like active galactic nuclei where the accretion rate is higher and the type of flow around them is different, um, it's a little bit cooler, then we would not be able to make these observations. The spectrum of those sources look very different and the event horizon is en enshrouded. So we would have to do these observations basically in the UV which means we would need space telescopes. Our, our atmosphere doesn't um, allow UV to come through. So the very early models of accretion disk images are for these thin, what we call thin disks, more AGN type disks. Um, and that is not applicable to actually what the EHT is doing and how our images form. So we chose them because they're nearby and because of that they're large angular size in the sky. But if they weren't low luminosity AGN, we would not be able to do this experiment at all. So that's, that's a bit of luck. The next question is from He. Uh, both the MET7 and ZJ star image appear to be face on image. Were we simply lucky about that? Is that... Uh, uh, Suspicious? Uh, suspicious that they both happen to be at John. Excellent question. So in M87, we knew the inclination uh, from the orientation of the jet before we even started. So it is 17 degrees um, off from our line of sight. So that does happen to be a, uh, a more face on uh, image. With SAJ star, the only thing we're able to say is that it's not edge on. I know that there is a tendency to, in, when we look at the image and how symmetric it is to say, oh, that must be face on, but it could be as much as 60 degrees inclined. So edge on would be 90 degrees, face on is zero degrees. It could be as much as 60 degrees inclined and still be consistent with the image that we are seeing. It just means that the Doppler effects of the, of the gas swirling around the black hole isn't as strong as an edge-on um, edge on and uh, Keplerian uh, flow. So um, M87, maybe we're lucky. It just happens that, you know, that's the orientation. Sajay star, we're lucky that it's not edge-on. Well, I mean, I guess we could have imaged it if it's edge on too. So there isn't really luck, but uh, we are not making the claim that it is face on. We're just saying it's edge on is inconsistent. 90, 75, et cetera, degrees are inconsistent. So it needs to be a little bit more face on than that. Okay, great. They clarify a lot of things. Uh, so uh, one last question just popped up. That's from uh, Daniel. So it's well known uh, why that peak in the data from April 11th appears. What are the effort uh, the collaboration is doing or planning on doing to overcome the challenge that feature brings to the analysis? Um, by the peak, uh, I'm assuming that um, Daniel is referring to the to the flare, so that brightening in the X-rays, um, is that correct? I'm, I'm gonna answer assuming that's, that's the question. Um, we've seen many of those. Uh, we actually have excellent statistics from many years of monitoring with Chandra and with Mu Star, um, the center of our galaxy. And we see that these X-ray flares happen. In fact, we see infrared flares too. Um, and X-ray flares are a little bit more rare, but they are, pretty bright. Um, infrared flares also happen. We think that that is some energy injection to part of the accretion flow that, um, that tends to make the source appear brighter for a short period of time and then that dissipates. There are models for what that is. Um, most likely scenario that I favor, but uh, this is act an active area of research, um, is reconnection. So magnetic fields that, that, that are brought closer um, in op opposing directions by the motion of the fluid um, tend to reconnect and that releases a lot of energy, magnetic energy as thermal energy into the particles and um, it's momentarily meaning for for maybe minutes to hours, 
um, heats them up and allows them to radiate more. We think something like that could explain all of this flaring activity that we see, um, but we haven't analyzed the April 11th data in particular uh, in connection to the EHD uh, data that we have to see if, uh, if we can say more than that. Okay, thank you. So we, we have two uh, new questions. Uh, do we still have time? Uh, I, I can take it, sure. Yeah, I have time. Okay, so sure. So, so the next one is, uh, you said at the end of the talk that the theory hasn't cracked yet, but you hope it will. Uh, any place you think it might crack or hope you may crack. Also, I was wondering, uh, how did you celebrate yesterday after the announcement? Thank you for those questions. Um, we were hoping that the environments of black holes is the place that they would crack, but it's probably a, a question of scale. Um, we are still probing fairly large scales in terms of length and um, the corresponding energy density. Um, in terms of even when you go to a black hole environment, it doesn't mean that you can see exactly what's happening around the horizon. So um, I don't know what we will need to do to see um, a deviation from general relativity and, or if it's um, completely shrouded from, from our view and it happens at even smaller scales um, than we are able to probe. Um, so we're going to keep looking. Um, we're going to have more precise measurements. If something leaks into the scales that we're able to probe, then hopefully um, we'll have a handle on it. If not, um, we're going to wait for our quantum gravity colleagues to, to come up with ideas that maybe we can test uh, through astrophysics. How did we celebrate yesterday? Um, we did have a nice party at the Smithsonian Castle, um, and it's... Uh, at least a moment to, to um, uh, acknowledge that the collaboration has come a long way and uh, we were able to uh, finish at least the 2017 data on our second source. Um, we, are, we are already planning the next observations and the next set of analyses, but um, it was a nice time to, for all of us to get together yesterday in Washington, these, at least people who were in Washington, D.C., and I'm sure our colleagues in Europe and Asia um, also did the same and uh, party a little bit. Yeah, I actually saw people crying during the celebration. You know, I guess, including Professor Osel, yourself, this has been more than your know, 10 years of uh, journey, so it's yeah, very sure. emotional. Oh. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I guess there are your two last questions. Uh, one is, uh, yesterday you said you do not completely trust the three bright spots in the ring. Uh, so do you trust the bright part in the ring of M87? No, um, the same types of imaging artifacts that we suspect in Sagittarius A star should be present or are likely to be present in M87. So. Um, from a theoretical point of view, having bright spots in an image is expected. Um, we, we've been talking um, throughout this webinar about how it's a turbulent environment, how energetic events happen, and it is perfectly reasonable that there is going to be a more magnetized region or a higher temperature region or something in that uh, turbulent flow that is going to appear to us as these knots in an image, um, brightness asymmetries um, in an image. But we are not there yet. Um, when I showed you that movie of the top set, um, maybe I can find it quickly enough to show you. I'll just show it to you like this. You see that even within this, the different reconstructions move those spots around. And furthermore, um, we do see them uh, being lined up with the primary orientations of the, of the shorter baselines. Um, so no, um, M87 has the potential for having the same types of artifacts. So um, the 
the glazing on the donut is uh, is in terms of the broad features, we trust it. In terms of the little sprinkles, we don't really trust it. Okay, so the last question, uh, will black hole jet be observed in Sagittarius? It doesn't seem to be there. We've looked and looked in, um, in many different wavelengths. Um, there is no indication of, certainly not a jet, nothing like M87's jet. If there is an outflow, um, maybe with observations in the future, um, whether this is at a different uh, a different DHT wavelength or multiple observations, maybe that show us uh, if the image is changing from hour to hour, um, or um, if we get more confirmation that there is a column that there is an organized magnetic field that could possibly collimate some of that outflowing material into. Um, in not a jet, but some sort of a uh, outflow structure, maybe. But uh, right now we're still at the at the point of um, being very um, saying we have seen no evidence of a of a jet inside J star. That's one of the main differences between the black hole in M eighty seven and the black hole at the center of our galaxy. Okay, great. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Osel, uh, for the wonderful presentation and the answer to all the questions. Uh, but everyone, please don't leave yet. Uh, so our project manager, Rosie, just uh, post a link to our survey. So again, this is very short. Uh, please fill it in. Uh, you will help us uh, to plan and improve the future webinar. Uh, there will be a, a new series of webinar coming out in the fall. So stay tuned. Uh, and again, you know, thank you everyone for attending. Goodbye. Thank you.